Cool. Okay. Um, yeah, welcome everyone. So uh, the purpose uh, of this talk is uh, a bit more an educational one rather than uh, one presenting new results uh, or new constructions. Um, the topic is about uh, what is on a more abstract level, uh, the consensus problem that proof-of-stake Ethereum uh, is trying to solve, at least in our understanding. Um, and, you know, how did we get here? Um, what are challenges with the current construction? Uh, and what could be done uh, to, to kind of mitigate them? And, um, yes, this is a joint work with Nusrat, who is also in the audience, and with my, my advisor, David, uh, who just spoke. Uh, and there, you know, it, it takes a village to raise a child, so there's a, a, a long list uh, of folks uh, from the Ethereum Foundation um, uh, who I want to, you know, give special thanks to. Um, so let's uh, dive right in. Um, we all know uh, the internet is a scary place, so, um, you know, here's, here's our consensus protocol. Unfortunately, we can't see the world map, but uh, it's happily producing blocks here. Right, um, everything's going well in our blockchain, except somehow, you know, suddenly half of the network disappears. And we're asking ourselves, what happened? Is there something, you know, going on in one part of the world uh, that we're not aware of? Is there war? Is there censorship? Is there a large-scale power outage? Or, you know, did one of these um, big ships damage one of our uh, ocean uh, cables and the network is, you know, partitioned? Maybe there was some uh, misconfiguration of the routing and uh, the network is split, so we have a network partition. The, the problem is, you know, us here in Amsterdam, uh, we cannot tell these two uh, situations apart, right? All we see is somehow, suddenly, we cannot talk to half of the network. And the question is, what should the ideal protocol do in this, uh, in this circumstance, right? So if the reason for not seeing half of the world is in fact a power outage, uh, then we would want the ideal protocol, um, you know, to keep, keep going, right? Produce more blocks. Um, this is a property which we call availability under dynamic participation. And um, let's revisit briefly uh, what we mean by this. This is a, a word that you know, sometimes shows up in, in discussions. So in order to understand what this means, let's unpack it a little bit. Um, for consensus, you need two basic properties, right? Every consensus protocol has to satisfy two basic properties. The first one is liveness. The second one we're going to see in a minute is safety. A consensus protocol that is only one of the two is not a good consensus protocol. It's trivial to produce consensus protocols that only have one of the two properties. You want both properties. So liveness means that transactions make it into our ledger you know, reasonably soon. Right? The ledger is alive, not just producing blocks, actually including transactions. Um, and availability is kind of a, a special version of that. Uh, namely, it means that the ledger remains live even if there is this weird kind of fluctuating participation. So even if few people show up, uh, we still want the, the protocol to be live. Even if, you know, two-thirds of the network disappear, the protocol should continue confirming transactions. Perhaps a little slower, but it should keep going. On the other hand, if we, the situation we're looking at is actually a network partition, uh, what should the protocol do now? Well, the thing is, if the protocol keeps going and keeps producing blocks, then there is risk that the guys on the other side of this, uh, of this cut, of this divide, right, they will also keep going, right? Because to them, it also looks like, well, you know, the, the Western half of the world has disappeared. We can't talk to them anymore. Let's just keep going. But then we end up with blockchains that are inconsistent, right? We have different blocks here uh, at the end. And uh, we don't want that. Right? That would be a safety violation. So in the, in the case of a network partition, let's not keep going. Right? Let's stop here. Um, let's wait for this, uh, for this situation to resolve uh, and, then, and then continue when we're, when we're all back together in one room. Um, this is a property, uh, for lack of a better term, we want to call finality. Um, and it, is, uh, it has some relationship to another property which uh, you know, often kind of in the discussions kind of uh, get mixed up, um, which is accountable safety. I think it makes sense to keep these two properties uh, separate. So for now, I'm going to call final um, safety on the network partition, and accountable safety is uh, something something stronger. David actually just mentioned it earlier. 
So safety means that the ledgers output by two different nodes um, at different points in time are consistent with one another. So that's just a, cons a basic consistency property. That's the second one of these important consensus properties that I mentioned earlier. And finality is a special flavor of this. It basically says, even if the network partitions, the protocol should remain safe. There are protocols that do not do this. There are protocols that do do this. Um, but this is what we call finality. And then accountable safety is a stronger version of safety. It means that um, if there is a safety violation, uh, you know, we want to be able to point to a certain set of validators and say, you guys uh, clearly have not followed the protocol. Otherwise, we would not be in this mess. Um, and we want this to, to hold for a, for a sizable fraction uh, of participants. And note that this implies safety because if there is no such sizable fraction of protocol violators, uh, then we cannot point to them, right? And so then there will be safety. So there's a stronger notion uh, than, than safety itself. Um, the thing is, us here in Amsterdam, since we can't tell the difference whether we're in a network partition or whether we're in a large-scale power outage event, um, we cannot always make the right decision, right? This is somehow pretty intuitive. Uh, academics sometimes take a little longer to understand uh, the intuitive things. So um, there is a, a long list of uh, literature uh, on this phenomenon uh, in, in various, uh, various terms and various levels of uh, formalization. But yeah, the bottom line is this. Um, there seem to be two dilemmas here. Right? We've mentioned three properties. We've mentioned availability, we've mentioned accountable safety, and we've mentioned liveness. And uh, there are two dilemmas here, meaning you, you know, from availability and finality, you can only have one in one a single ledger protocol. Um, and from availability and accountability, you can only have one for your ledger. Your ledger needs to make a decision. Now, that's a bit unfortunate, right? Um, so I, what I've just told you is, well, you, you get to pick. You want availability or you want finality and, and accountability. Um, so let's see, can we pick? And the thing there is, um, you know, coming from the application, coming from kind of the, the, yeah, the, the economics and, and the security requirements, um, it seems hard to pick. Right, so let's look at two examples. Uh, we have here our imaginary, uh, an imaginary car dealer uh, and an imaginary coffee uh, vendor. And um, well, the, the economic reality of the car dealer is the car dealer probably has few transactions a day. They're rather slow, they're rather high value. Um, you know, high value enough perhaps if it's a nice car that it's, it's worth to, you know, tamper with the, with the payment settlement process if, if you had a chance to do so, right? On the other hand, the, uh, the coffee dealer, right, has many transactions, fairly quick transactions, um, low value transactions, and you probably won't go through the hassle of, uh, you know, mounting any form of attack on, on your payment system just to get a free coffee. That's maybe not worth the, worth the hassle. And so coming from uh, these kind of economic realities, um, these guys have very different approaches when it comes to what they expect from their protocol, right? The, the car dealer is a little bit more pessimistic uh, and thinks everybody's perhaps out to get them, right? So peers that I don't hear from, they're probably plotting against me. Maybe let's not move the protocol forward if we cannot be absolutely sure that it is safe to do so. Whereas uh, the coffee vendor is like, it's fine. Nobody is going to try and screw me over, right? These guys that are not talking to me, they're probably just, I don't know, out on a vacation, um, power outage, I don't know. Um, so let, let's, let's keep going because I need to sell my coffee, right? It gets cold otherwise. Um, so the car dealer wants finality and accountability. Um, the coffee dealer wants availability, and um, it seems hard to choose, right? So in light of these previous dilemmas, um, it seems we have to make a choice, um, but it seems hard to make a choice. And in fact, um, you know, looking at kind of the landscape of protocols, um, we see that protocols kind of embody uh, their you know choice in in this trade-off, right? So there are, I would argue, there are like uh, two. You know, pretty different families of protocol. On the one hand, we have uh, what I call here partially synchronous propose and vote style protocols. And on the other hand, we have more of these uh, Nakamoto style, longest chain inspired protocols. Um, so partially synchronous uh, propose and vote style protocols are PBFT, Tendermint, Hot Stuff, and Casper FFG. 
And on the other hand, we have things like Bitcoin uh, and, and Varian, so you know, Ethereum 1, Ouroboros, which is uh, the, the, the protocol behind Cardano, uh, and Ghost. And now you might already notice that um, there's something interesting going on here. Um, these two names, you see them in the discussion uh, of Ethereum 2, right? So somehow this seems to suggest something's going on in Ethereum 2. We're trying to, oh, it's called proof of stake Ethereum nowadays. Um, uh, we're trying to kind of uh, uh, reconcile this somehow. Um, so, so how? Um, so the thing is this, right? Ideally, we would want to have a single ledger, and we want you know everything from this ledger. It should be accountably safe all the time. It should be live all the time, no matter whether there is a partition or whether there is like low participation, all these things. But we know that this cannot be done, and so the the um, the approach to to you know work around this impossibility result um, is this idea of nesting ledgers, um, and the idea there is. Uh, maybe we should decompose this single ledger into two ledgers, really, or really into you know one ledger of which we see different different sections of it. So there is an available full ledger. We take the single ledger, we decompose it into an available full ledger, and into an accountably safe and final prefix ledger. And now we can you know specialize the the security uh, properties that we want to guarantee for each of these two. You know, parts of the of the overall ledger. So we want the available full ledger to be safe and live under dynamic participation, but only if the network is not partitioned, right? We know that if the network is partitioned, then there's not much we can do. If we also want dynamic participation, um, and on the other hand, uh, we say, okay, this this uh, prefix ledger it should always be accountably safe, and on the other hand, we're we're compromising on the liveness. So this one is only live if the network is not partitioned and if enough people uh, are there to, to cast their votes. And uh, given this, uh, you know, these two ledgers now, um, our two uh, vendors, right, can pick the ledger or the piece, the part of the ledger uh, that is important to them, that has the properties that they care about. So the car vendor picks the prefix. Um, it has slightly longer settlement time, uh, but um, stronger safety guarantee. Um, and the, the coffee vendor uh, picks the full ledger, and it settles faster, but it is a little bit less safe. And this idea of nested ledgers, arguably, uh, you know, once it's cast in this way, um, is not us. Us is not the first uh, to do this. If you go back, for example, to uh, Nakamoto's white paper, then you will notice that you know, for different K's, you also obtain these nested ledgers, right? It's if a client runs the protocol with a higher K in the K deep uh, confirmation rule, then their uh, ledger will will be a prefix of uh, any client that has a smaller K. So this idea of, of nesting ledgers in order to achieve different uh, trade-offs of, uh, of uh, latency and, and uh, safety um, is, has already been there before. So uh, the thing there is, you know, the, the big takeaway is that this, this idea of nesting multiple ledgers uh, provides a way for us to reconcile these conflicting application requirements. Um, it allows us to formalize uh, what the goals are of these finality and accountability gadget constructions. Um, now that we have a formal goal of what we're trying to achieve, we can actually go and, and, and do a rigorous uh, formal security analysis and, and prove some theorems to make sure that you know, our protocols actually satisfy those. Uh, we, we have a description that is extensible to other uh, requirements we might have. For example, something that is very much uh, under discussion right now is reorg resilience, uh, and it very much fits into this picture. Um, and given this picture, we can uh, come up with generic constructions of how to get such nested ledger protocols uh, from basic constituent protocols. And I want to look a little bit into that uh, now towards the end of the talk. Um, how would we build something like this? Uh, and here's, here's one architecture uh, on how you can get such a nested uh, ledger protocol. Um, so, you know, the big box is the overall protocol. Uh, transactions are coming in from the left. And you pick one of your favorite available protocols, say longest chain protocol, um, in order to, uh, to order these transactions, and you obtain a ledger. Now, you cannot output this ledger, right? This is, okay, this ledger is a, is a chain of blocks. Um, 
You then uh, snapshot them, so periodically you look at what this ledger looks like, um, you take a snapshot, uh, and you input that into an accountable, uh, partially synchronous uh, BFT protocol, say Casper FFT, uh, pick whichever you like, um, and what you get from this is an ordering of s snapshots, so a chain of chains of blocks. Um, you need to unwrap them, uh, con concatenate them, uh, clean them up a little bit because there are duplicates in there. Uh, but what you end up then with is an accountable finalized ledger, right? Um, and then you take that ledger and you prepend it to the other ledger. You, remember, you want to make sure that there is this prefix property. Um, and then the result of that, again, you clean it up a little bit and you output it as the available ledger. And the nice thing about this architecture is it's a very simple flow from left to right. There is no loops here. Um, it just, you know, you start at the top left, you end up at the bottom right. Uh, it's very linear to reason about. Um, there is another uh, way which is uh, the more common way of, of trying to build uh, constructions like this, uh, which, which works like this. Again, your transactions enter here from the left. You put them into your favorite available protocol, say longest chain. You get a ledger. Um, you output this ledger as the available ledger. That um, necessitates something later on. Now you need to make sure that you know, the, the prefix of this ledger uh, has to be finalized, right? So you need to be careful about what I need to tell you how, how we're going to ensure that. Um, then you take checkpoints from this ledger. You put them into an accountable, partially synchronous BFT protocol. Um, and you get another ledger, our, our blue ledger. Um, and we output that as the accountable finalized prefix. But now we need to make sure that this prefix, um, you know, the, 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 the blue ledger is always a prefix of, of the orange ledger. Right now that's not guaranteed, right? So uh, the way the protocols go about this is they introduce a feedback loop and they say, we're going to change a little bit this uh, available protocol um, and we're going to make it respect whatever ch checkpoints have been decided by the downstream uh, checkpointing mechanism. And so um, the thing with this construction is now you get this, uh, this feedback cycle. Um, but I would argue, yeah, maybe it's still, it's still an intuitive way to, to go about the, the design goal, right? Um, and this is pretty much um, uh, the architecture that you see in proof of stake Ethereum uh, as it is today. So uh, there, they didn't pick longest chain, they didn't pick you know, any accountable PSYNC BFT protocol, uh, but it's LMD Ghost and it's Casper FFG. Right? Um, and well, the, uh, the challenges that, that I mentioned about this architecture, um, we, we see them come up in the current uh, POS ETH construction. So one thing is that the security of LMD Ghost of this uh, available protocol uh, seems rather brittle in general. Um, so there have been a bunch of attacks on uh, that protocol in, the, in like uh, formal models. Um, you know, then there is this most recent uh, proposer boost uh, in order to overcome these uh, balancing attacks. And then you can refine the balancing attack a little bit. Uh, and then you need to make another fix uh, in order to, to kind of work around this. I think it's fair to say that, you know, LMD Ghost by itself seems, seems a little uh, brittle a protocol. Um, the other thing is, I think that's, that's still uh, on the agenda. Um, Currently, LMD Ghost as, a, as an available protocol is in some sense a little bit ill-defined because it doesn't have a clear confirmation rule. So unlike in the longest chain proof of work protocol where we know that you know, if we chop off K deep, then we have some handle on what the, what the error probability is uh, that we will see a reversion that is longer than K, um, we do not have any such guarantee uh, for the LMD Ghost protocol. Um, so this is something that um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll still have to figure out uh, downstream. Um, and then the other thing is this, is this feedback loop that I mentioned earlier. Um, so the checkpoint uh, feedback that comes from Casper FFG and goes back into the LMD Ghost uh, uh, protocol seems rather brittle. Um, again, there have been attacks on this, uh, for example, this bouncing attack uh, from a while back, uh, but more recently um, attacks, this is from 2021, um, and you know, arguably, they all have to do with this with this kind of interaction. And again, there is uh, you know ways to to try and patch this, um, but uh, this is still very much uh, ongoing uh, work. So um, let me conclude. Um, 
the the first thing I want to want you to take away from this is, you know, sometimes uh, you might realize that a single ledger protocol cannot satisfy all the consensus security and application requirement that you want your protocol to satisfy. Uh, in that case, nesting ledgers can help you reconcile these uh, conflicting requirements. Um, in there are basic constructions. There are like you know, compositions of basic protocols um, that help you uh, build, implement such nested ledgers. Uh, but if you do so, you need to be careful at uh, designing and, and rigorously analyzing how these uh, constituent protocols interact. Um, and finally, um, there has recently been more talk about this uh, thing called single slot finality. And um, yeah, I hope this gives us a new chance to uh, come up with more solid foundation for proof of stake ETH. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes for some questions. If you have a question, I'll pass on the microphone. Hey, so you outlined like two two different methods to, for how to how to build this. Uh, the second one that you said that Ethereum proof of stake is moving forward with the first one. Did are there like so you outlined also challenges with the second one? Are there challenges associated with the first way to build this as well? Uh, yes, um, it's a bit technical. Um, so one challenge that comes with the first construction um, is that the moment you're producing a block in this longest chain protocol, um, you don't actually know what the prefix it will be if that block makes it uh, into your ledger, right? So in in you know most protocols, it's it's the way that you know when you compose a block, you're able to select transactions that should go into this block because you know that either this block makes it into into the output ledger, in which case it will have the prefix that's determined by its parent, um, or it won't make it into the output uh, ledger. Then you don't have to worry. Um, here it's a slightly different um, in that you produce blocks, but then later uh, there are some checkpoints. Uh, some snapshots that are prepended uh, to the ledger that you're producing. And uh, those snapshots, they could contain transactions that invalidate some of the transactions um, that you are about to introduce uh, in the new block that you're building. In particular, that's the case if there was a network partition recently. Um, yeah, pretty much that. So uh, if, you know, the, if, if there recently was a situation on the network partition where perhaps this available uh, protocol was not safe, and has seen some reorgs, um, not reorgs as like close to the tip, but even like longer reorgs, um, then that might introduce uh, t via the snapshots transactions that are uh, conflicting with the transactions that you're about to introduce uh, into the longest chain protocol. And that's why you have to do this uh, uh, cleanup step here. Um, and yeah, that's, that's a challenge that comes with, with this approach. Any more questions? So, how in, how in your mind would, would single slot fin finality help to resolve the some of the problems exposed and and how to build this number two? Um, yeah. So, with single slot finality, we basically get a chance to uh, you know clean up this diagram. Um, with single thought finality, perhaps there is no need to have these two uh, separate protocols, right? Because we're, we're basically, we, we would be trying to, to run the second protocol faster. Um, one reason we cannot you know, run this protocol faster is because it needs a lot of votes in order to provide accountability. And you know, up until recently, we were of the opinion that that takes either a lot of bandwidth or some time in order to do. Um, and that's, you know, arguably why we wanted to have this available protocol um, ahead of time to, to give some, some notion of safety. Um, now, if we are able to, to speed up um, this, this finality protocol here or this accountability protocol, um, then that puts us in a better position to try and not do this, uh, this split in the first place. Um, and the other thing is, is more kind of a, a meta point. It's, um, you know, single slot finality gives us an opportunity to, uh, you know, step a little back from, from the current construction and reconsider some of the, the choices that were made. And I think in particular, this choice of uh, LMD ghost uh, for the available protocol is, is something that um, seems rather brittle. And um, in the current protocol, we, we might not be able to change it 
um, because it's you know pretty fundamental. But uh, if we do a redesign, then that gives us some more breathing room to uh, you know explore more openly what's possible. Yes. Yeah, I'm uh, just trying to think out of the box instead of how we've been building uh, this chain. Uh, because I see there's a lot of issues in the communication layer, right? When we're actually trying to see which are the networks that are alive and which are the uh, blockchains that are being uh, created, you know, like, we, are they like, are they still synchronous, right? Are they being Fox or whatever? Why do we think, uh, have you tried, like, looking into, like, how Torrent Network does it, right? Where you actually kind of have a hash table of which are the networks that are actually live right now, right? So you actually can do a liveness test, right? But instead of, you know, like, uh, instead of going up and worrying about the Fox that will happen all the way. I'm, I'm not sure I, I understand the question. I, I think you, with this approach, you would probably run into pretty serious trouble with a Byzantine adversary. Like testing liveness is, the adversary will make, you know, some of your nodes think that it's live and some others think that it's not live. And now your nodes have like different opinion about where they are in the protocol and then stuff pretty quickly falls, falls apart from downstream. So um, I think, I don't know, maybe I misunderstood the question. No, I mean, that's, that's what I'm getting to. Because right now, if you have like multiple, you know, because we're a well-distributed network, yeah. right? If let's say, let's say Europe is not really communicating with the Asian network, that's where you kind of start having those box, right? For the, the two uh, diverging networks and two diverging databases, right? But what if, let's say, if you can just do a hash table of getting, uh, you know, like of checking, like which are the nodes that are actually active and are asynchronous right now? We can maybe even do it ZK proof if we want to hide those IPs or we want to hide those particular, uh, you know, like uh, nodes itself. But we will actually get, uh, uh, you know, like during the type of block that all these nodes are actually available, all these nodes are actually live and are synchronous. If you get a majority of those nodes that are available, we just produce a block. Yeah, I think you, you'll, you'll run into trouble once the adversary becomes Byzantine, right? The adversary will pretend to part of your network that it's not available. It'll pretend to another part of the network that everything's fine. And then your, your honest nodes are now confused about whether or not Europe is there or not, right? And then they go forward with like different, you know, different assumptions about where we are. And then the, I, I don't see a way to, uh, to reconcile this. Okay. Talk more about it after this. Yeah, happy to. A final question? All right. Thank you, Joachim. And thanks. Thanks for keeping, keeping us accountable. So next up, we have Sriram from University of Washington. You'll struggle finding reading papers recently without his name popping up everywhere. So very excited to have him. Um, give it up to Sriram. <laughs> 